Father Maximilian Sell, a biographical play on the life of St. Maximilian Kolbe. My name is John Jacoby, and I will perform the character of Father Maximilian Kolbe. My name is Drew Piatek, and I'll perform the character of a friar. My name is Paul Hearn, and I'll perform the character of a friar. As his monk's way began by taking on the veil, that is the frock, I shall now put on this Franciscan armor. <laughs> Wearing a new creation over the old one, Raymond Colbe. This was the name of the young man who since that day became Brother Maximilian. <laughs> put on his monk's frock for the first time. on September 4th, 1910, and he never took it off. And he never allowed his brothers to do so. He used to say that a friar should never take off his frock because it is a symbol of his vocation, because the frock reminds both the friar and those who look upon him, who he is at all times. He liked to tell that St. Francis Flower story of how a saint once went on, along with a brother, preached the word of God in the village. As they walked along the road through the village, the saint said nothing. And upon leaving the village, the brother asked, Father, we were supposed to evangelize the people. And saint Francis answered, We walked through the village wearing our poor frocks. Actions speak louder than words. So, saint Maximilian never took off his frock. Never, let's be exact, never on his own will or whim. Once he had to wear civilian clothes for a train trip across Bolshevik Russia traveling to Japan. The Soviets did not allow clergy in their paradise. It was necessary to wait half a year for special permission, and even then it might have been denied. So he dressed as a civilian for the 10-day trip on the Trans-Siberia train. The second time was when the Germans ordered him to take off his frock at the Pauviak prison in Warsaw. I'll tell you more later about that. Except for these two instances, he never took off his frock. In spite of the freezing cold or oppressive heat in Japan, the tropical humidity in India or Ceylon, or on a ship sailing the southern seas, and in Poland, <coughs> A lecture hall or a sanatorium, a construction site or the printing shop. Never. Yes, he was crazy. He was God's fool. He was absolutely faithful to his resolutions and decisions. Faithful to the extreme. He was unyieldingly consistent. Adamant in practicing the vows of poverty, obedience, and chastity. Uncompromising, loving his neighbor, in the service to the Immaculate, and in his striving for sanctity. Imagine, I am in Father Maximilian's cell, in Gable Milanov, behind the sacristy of the chapel barrack, and a similar one in the skyscraper located nearby, built while he was in Japan. When upon his return he saw it, he called it a skyscraper. For it was the very first multi-story building in the Apokalanov. Well, two-story, and made of brick. Previously, only one level barracks had been built, made of lumber and clay. An identical Father Maximilian cell is still preserved in Nagasaki, Japan, in the monastery that he erected there, Mugunzai no Sono. A table with that distinctive pigeonhole shelf, correspondence, documents. A chair. Behind the screen, a narrow iron bed with a thin straw mattress, blanket, and a pillow. <laughs> Under the bed, a wash basin and a jar of cold water as his entire bathroom. Utter penury, utter simplicity. Evangelical and Franciscan poverty radically practiced to the extreme, as everything in his life. 
I want to speak to you about a saint. Sainthood is a mystery. The mystery of sanctity of a man or a woman, as every mystery, is a chain of circles dissolving in the water after a stone was dropped. It is a seismic wave spreading out from the epicenter of an earthquake, and then dying down. I'll try to at least touch upon this mystery. A saint himself leads to it. He leaves behind his prayers, utterances, writings. Memories of his works lives. Testimonies of his deeds are available. But a saint also leads us by his lifestyle, by his decisions, choices, conduct, by his ascents and failures, by his joys and sorrows. It is possible to close in on the mystery of sanctity by engaging the means of reason, intuition, imagination, as well as meditation and prayer. But eventually, a high threshold appears, an insurmountable threshold beyond which lies only an impenetrable darkness, or rather, a light shining so brightly that it blinds. A mystery remains a mystery. <coughs> but a biography of a man can be investigated, studied, elucidated, penetrated. It is possible to tell from what family someone came. Father Maximilian was the son of poor weavers in the small town of Zdunskavola. We can establish in what circles he moved about, who were his friends and foes, with whom he worked. A biography also contains dates, facts, documents, such as school certificates or diplomas of earned degrees. Father Maximilian had two documents in philosophy and theology. One can verify someone's presence in certain places. Someone's records, for example the ship's company logs, or prison's files. The most important dates in St. Maximilian's life are as follows. He was born in 1894. He made his solemn profession as a Franciscan in 1914. He created the Malizia della Macalana in 1917, ordained a priest in 1918. He started publishing Immaculate's Night in 1922. First print, 5,000 copies. By 1939, one million, and all publications printed in April Kalana, which had become a publishing giant, reached 16 million that year. This can be counted. A biography can also be measured in time and space. By measuring someone's travels, for instance, Father Maximilian traveled many seas and oceans. He visited Italy and France. He worked in Japan. He passed through Russia and Korea. A biography can also be presented in the form of a timeline. 1894 to 1907, Stunskabola. 1907 to 1912, Lavoux. 1912, 1919, Rome. 1919 to 1922, Krakow. 1922 to 1927, Gradma. 1927 to 1930, Nieper Kalanov. There, out of nothing, on empty fields near the village of Teresa, he erected a monastery which grew into an entire town. 1930 to 1936, Japan, where he also erected a monastery, and then an entire monastic complex. 1936 to 1941, again Nepokalanov, but with a break for his imprisonment by the Germans from September 19th to December 8th, 1939. This was his first imprisonment. 
The second, February 17, 1941. The action of the story I'm telling you takes place on that very day in the morning in Yebo Kalama. But at any moment, the Gestapo will come and arrest him and transport him to the Pavlyak prison in Warsaw. On May 28th, he was transported to Auschwitz. There he died on August 14th, that year, 1941. Behold, we have to add two dates referring to his life after his earthly death. Pope Paul VI canonized Maximilian Kolbe in 1971, and Pope John Paul II canonized him in 1982. Sanctity steadily grows, develops, penetrates, and directs the totality of a man's life. In his everyday interactions with people, his activities, his words, his decisions, not losing their ordinary, natural, or real character, they gradually acquire a different dimension. As if still living in the mundane realm, a saintly person would be already reaching an otherworldly state. 